So here we go. I'll start here. So I'll cover um, today how we did some work to integrate um, the Docker experiences we start having with the uh, existing file systems we, we used for distributing our software. So I'll go quickly into this. I just put here the credits of other people that, um, that participate in this effort. Um, so just a quick introduction to, to explain why we did this and uh, why we had to do some of this work. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. We are based in Geneva in Switzerland, uh, founded in 54. We have 22 member states, but a lot of other countries participating in our activities. Our main mission is fundamental research uh, in higher energy physics. Uh, here is an overview of uh, what we do these days. So uh, we have uh, um, several accelerators, uh, the main one being the Large Hadron Collider. You might have heard of it uh, a couple of years ago, and still these days it keeps coming. Uh, so the accelerator is 100 meters underground. Uh, it spans Switzerland and France. Uh, it's 27 kilometers in perimeter. And uh, from time to time, uh, we... Uh, make some collisions of uh, different particles in, in the massive detectors, you can see them. So in the accelerator, we actually accelerate uh, protons in two different directions to very close to the speed of light so that we gain a lot of energy and we can see uh, um, lots of new things from the collisions. On the right side, you see a, a picture of the Atlas detector in construction, very early phase. You can see a small man there. Uh, the Atlas detector is in a cavern that is 60 meters high. Um, and we have three more uh, similar detectors. On the left side, you have the tunnel where the accelerator is, is going. Uh, so it's uh, quite complex. Uh, the main complexity here is that every time we have collisions, we are actually generating uh, around one petabyte a second of data in, in the detectors. So we obviously can't store all of it. So we have uh, uh, what we call a high-level trigger that, based on hardware, will filter that to a much smaller amount of data that we actually have to store. And that's around one gigabyte a second or per experiment. So a couple of gigabytes a second we have to store. So to process of all, all this data, we have a data center uh, at CERN. So our data center has something like uh, uh, around close to 9,000 physical nodes these days. It has uh, two, uh, almost 300,000 cores and uh, 30, on, on our data center, we are running services and, and processing farms that uh, run also on VMs and uh, close to 35,000 VMs, uh, close to 3,000 users, some based at CERN, but many uh, split around the world. And uh, the total amount of data we currently store is, around, is over 200 petabytes, but we are adding something like 70 petabytes every year when, when the accelerator is running. Uh, you can also see that uh, our data center, we have an extension in, in Hungary. Now, even with this data center, we don't have enough capacity to process all of this. So in the two, early 2000s, we started developing uh, what we call the LHC computing grid. This, uh, what we did is we created a network of different centers and universities around the world that participate with us. We set up the network links that are needed and we reuse their capacity uh, to help us with processing the LHC data. So on the left, you see uh, a visualization of all these links in action. Uh, with green lines for the ones that are good and red lines the ones that are bad. And on the right side, you see that it's kind of hierarchical with the uh, CERN being the tier zero in the center. And then we have some big centers that we call the tier ones and then the tier twos, which are smaller centers that still have a lot of computing capacity that we can use. Uh, this is important to understand uh, why we had to work on this. Um, and it's been quite successful until now. So to distribute, to 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 be able to use all this capacity, one of the main things is how do we get the software to the site? So uh, uh, the physics analysis is based on experiment software. It's developed by a lot of physics, physicists around the world. They have constant releases. And we had an issue which was making sure that the right version and the right versions of all the software was available in each of the sites. Um, this meant uh, that uh, very often was making sure RPMs are installed, or the distribution packages are available, and this was tedious and uh, error prone. So we, a few years ago, we created this CERN VM file system, which uh, follows the hierarchical structure we have on the infrastructure itself and makes us publish the software on the tier zero, on the top at CERN, and make sure we spread 
the software all over the sites using a, a, a read-only file system. So this is based on a Fuse module. Uh, so it offers a POSIX interface in user space. And it, what it's in, the, in essence, what it is, is a series of HTTP caches. So the, the file system at the, at the sites is read-only. We can only push at the top. And then everything gets a, a copy of this. It's uh, on demand. So it means uh, the sites have a local cache that uh, uh, won't have the, the totality of the software, of course. And uh, as they require from the jobs that are running there, then the software will appear there. It also has uh, a lot of data integrity checks and similar things. There's a link here if you're more interested in this. Now, more recently, recently we started doing a lot of things with containers. Um, I think the, the main uh, use case for the physics area is that physicists are very excited about being able to package all their analysis in one unit that they can refer or give a reference to their colleagues and say, run this, you'll get these results. And it's kind of guaranteed that this will be the case. Everything is packaged inside in one single unit, and this is reusable. And this is very important if you're doing uh, this kind of research. The other use case we have is large clusters where people can do interactive analysis. So they go and they use Jupyter Notebooks uh, style uh, things, which means instead of having to have a complex system installed on their laptop or log into some uh, central terminal, we offer them a nice web interface where they can do their analysis. This is also very powerful. It allows us to grow the clusters uh, as the demand comes and goes. Uh, the first use cases we treated were not this. The first one is actually continuous integration, which I believe it's the easiest one uh, to, to start with. Um, so we do a lot of things. Uh, the internal systems we have, we, we use containers for the con continuous integration and validation of our software. And then slowly we are migrating our own infrastructure services also to containers. So one thing we, have he we had here is that we had to somehow accommodate the existing system we had, which was using this CERN VMFS to distribute the software with the new container world. So there are many options we could take there. But the main thing we, we have to do is to make sure that the software is available to the containers. So the, if, as the software is already at every site using uh, this CVMFS file system, then we should build on it. Uh, Docker, we heard a lot of talks uh, describing how pluggable and how easy it is to, to, to write uh, plugins and drivers. So this is something we exploit quite a bit. So what the first step we, we've done is that for images that are not too badly defined, we can rely on the image being put at the site when the, with the Docker pool normally. And then the majority of the software will come from CERN VMFS using the same kind of uh, hierarchical distribution that we already had. So this was very easy to implement. There's a link here to the code. Uh, the way it works is uh, the CVMFS file system will, the plugin will run in a container that manages uh, uh, the shared mounts of, the, of this file system on the host and on every containers, uh, that's, that is started, it will do a, do a bind mount depending on the repositories it will request. So this is very easy. The only difference from the normal command is that you specify that you want to use the CVMFS volume driver either while creating a volume or instantiating your container. Now the harder part was to distribute the images. We started seeing some cases where people were having uh, images that were, because it's so easy and to, to share, you, people have a tendency to pack a lot of things inside the images. It's definitely not a best practice, but, but it's something that happens in, in our community. Uh, the reason for this is that when you do your analysis, you need the software, but you also need a lot of knowledge about the conditions of the detector while the run was uh, happening. So you have the data you want to analyze, but you want a lot of metadata that will help you with your analysis. So they started packing all of this in, in the containers themselves. This meant that we thought were large images, one gigabyte suddenly became 18 gigabytes and we have some completely crazy cases. Uh, we try to talk to them and, and make it better, but uh, we also try to find a solution for this. So this is, just imagine if you have a cluster of a couple of hundred nodes and suddenly someone launches an analysis that goes to all the nodes at the same time and they all pull the same image that is not available. Uh, we killed the registry, our internal registry a couple of times. Now it's also behaving better. 
but apart from scale testing, this is not ideal. Um, so we wrote uh, this uh, graph driver. So Jakob and uh, Nicola that I mentioned uh, earlier, they wrote this graph driver. So it builds on AUFS and Overlay 2. The main reason is that uh, these are file-based, so it matches the, the, the file system we have available. And the way it works is on the left side, you see a regular Docker image with many layers. And uh, these are actual data layers. And then on the right side, you see how this uh, CVMFS image behaves. So yeah, it's called, we call it a thin image. Instead of actually having the, the, the data for each layer, all we keep is a JSON file that describes the repository in CVMFS where the data will be available and the ID of the layer. So that means that the actual image that you'll push to any registry, you can do a Docker push once you converted this image, uh, is a small JSON file. That's all you, you publish. And then when you pull, also all you pull is a JSON file and the container starts up immediately. So this is uh, makes the whole process uh, a lot uh, faster. Uh, then once the image is available on the node, uh, the, every time a file on one of the layers will be requested, then the driver knows how to mount the actual directory of that layer, and it will pull on a file basis instead of pulling each of the layers. So if the image is badly defined with massive layers, we still have a massive gain because we will only access the files that we, we absolutely require. So there's also a, a link there. So the last part of I'll cover here is some, some tests we've done with this. So to, to run these tests, we created a, on our production infrastructure a cluster of uh, 100 nodes. Um, so these are VMs running on our production OpenStack cloud. We have a tool that makes it very easy to create uh, clusters, container clusters on the cloud. The only thing we say is that we need the CVMFS storage driver. And then to benchmark the, the whole uh, exercise, we used an internal benchmark suit we have that hammers a uh, system using common workloads from the experiments. And we did a Docker server create with this global mode, which means there will be a replica of this container on every single node in the cluster. So it mimics very well this use case where you have a large cluster, completely fresh, and suddenly you try to pull a very large image from all the nodes at the same time. Um, we tried two sizes. So one is the large and one is close to the very large with one and 10 gigs. And uh, here are the results of a fresh cluster without CVMFS. So you can see that with a one gig a gigabyte image, so the way it works is you have a timeline and then every time uh, an analysis finishes, it just sends a messages, message to our messaging system and you see the result popping. So you can see that for the first result, and the, the analysis will execute very quickly in this case. So you can count that the, the peak there is when the container is started. Uh, so we can see that with one gigabyte for the first one to show up, because there's a lot of load on the registry and data being transferred, takes around five minutes. If we go to the 10 gigabyte, we can go to 15 minutes very easily. Now then we wanted to exercise with the CVMFS. And in this case, sorry for splitting the, the diagrams, but I couldn't put them top to bottom because the plots are too small. So on the left, you have the one gigabyte. And you can see that they start in around five seconds. And then in the 10 gigabytes, which we would expect maybe to increase, it's still five seconds. The reason for this is that the amount of data that is actually used by the container, the amount of files, is still very small. Uh, and uh, so the container startup time is, is, stays constant pretty much. So even if the, the image is growing a lot, in most cases, the data is, is not used. And we keep a constant startup time. So this is, this is very positive results. Uh, and we, we are starting to offer this uh, to, to our users uh, now. So as a summary, uh, we integrated uh, an existing file system that we use in production for many users, many years, uh, with, uh, by just developing new Docker plugins. Uh, we benefit from a massive caching infrastructure that we use for distributing the software. Uh, the gains come from, from this uh, caching that we have, but also from the fact that we start relying on files instead of layers when, when we access the, uh, the, 
the data in the images. And the gains come in startup time, as we showed here, but also on network usage. The amount of data being downloaded for each node and per site is, is much smaller. So we'll continue doing these tests. And uh, the next steps will be to attempt to do the same using multiple clouds. So we've done these tests internally at CERN, but the, there will be even bigger gains if we start considering running this on uh, on uh, hundreds of sites. And the other thing we want to test is further tests on the worm versus cold cache. So if the data is also already available on the nodes, the very small amount of data that containers uh, need, this will be even faster and compare this to when the image, the full image is already available on the node. And that's it. So I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. OK. Questions? Here we go. Yep. So uh, uh, what happened uh, continuous uh, if a server uh, crashes or uh, just a hanging? Uh, you mean the, our our file system servers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a hierarchical uh, structure. So each site will have one or several copies of these uh, replicas. So these are basically HTTP server serving files. So you can easy, very easily load balance it, this, and also the driver will fall back to the regular image in case there's a problem. So if the layer is not available in the normal image, we can have it still understands the normal uh, registry and will go to it. Uh, all the servers uh, uh, goes down, uh, so continue uh, get uh, some uh, error code from, from uh, read system code, right? If all the servers go down in the whole file system hierarchy, well, well, hopefully this will. But yeah, if the data is available locally, it's cached on the node, so it keeps going. Yeah. If if the container has started, it won't impact because we still use a union file system with a writable layer on top on top of all of this. So this will, won't be impacted. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't depend, once it starts running, it doesn't depend any longer on the, on the file system. OK, maybe, maybe just as a pretext as well, it, you, you talk about like one gigabyte images and 10 gigabyte images. And uh, at the conference, we, we saw like guys trying to squeeze or to put down. And, and Natal will we'll talk about Alpine Linux uh, later. So we try to make it as small as possible. Yeah. And you, you talk about 10 gigabyte images as if it would be the normal thing, right? But actually, it's, it's pretty edgy. I, if you talk to internal Docker engineers and ask them, yeah, yeah we, we pull down a 10 gigabyte image, they will, like, they will go like this and say, oh, yeah. you're crazy. So, so in our case, it's not something we, we recommend people to do. It's just something that people do. And, yeah, uh, sure. It's, yeah. This was kind of a way to go around it. Um, if they sit with us, we try to convince them to have smaller image and rely on the on the volume driver to access the software in CVMFS. Yeah. But there's things that they don't convince their uh, groups to put in the main file system, and then they pack them in the image. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not plainly wrong, right? It's just right. the use case of your users are different. They want to contain everything in one container, and this is why the yep. image is so big, right? Yep. And I mean, but it's it's amazing that. Within Docker, it's it's hard to convince people that like 10 gigabyte images are a good thing. Or uh, even we have one customer who's like 90 gigabyte images, right. and then you, you you tell it to engineers and say, well, 90 gigabytes, you're crazy. But yeah, it's not. Yep. It's not. It's it's a use case. I think the, the outcome of this effort was also that uh, this fine file granular granularity really serves a purpose for us, and it may be something interesting for other people too. Yeah. Other questions? Details. Ah, sorry. Uh, well, I'm yeah. sorry. It was too fast. Uh, so it's Ricardo dot Russia. I'll, I'll give you after. I yeah. think it's on the on the agenda as well. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. 